And that brings us to step eight. To persevere in the identity that God has brought me to. Uh, Steve Gallagher, one of the things we must realize is that if God were to instantly set us free, it would be much easier to, for us to return to the old habits. And part of what we want to get from that is that the fear of the Lord is more precious than anything that was promised to us in chapter 3. It, that part of the reason anything worth having is worth working for, we tell our kids that. Somehow we don't want that to be true in our walk with God. And if we don't get that, then our struggle for freedom will become a point of bitterness. And we'll begin to resent God because it's hard. Now, uh, there are times when the change is hard. Uh, Tim Chester, he says here, uh, porn is easy. It's trouble free. Its pleasures are instant. Marriage is hard work. It involves two sinners being thrown together in close proximity. Marriage is a gift for service. And sex is gloriously given to cement that partnership. But don't let sex become the goal of marriage. Otherwise, porn may seem like a good alternative. Again, we, the work, the work at this point hopefully is not so much resisting temptation as it is cultivating authentic relationships. If you're married with your spouse, if you're single with your small group and other friends, that the work, by the time we get to step eight, is hopefully what we are running to more than what we're running from. It, uh, Tim Chester. Now he comes back and says, it may be easier than we think. He says, I've found that many men can stop habitual masturbation more readily than they imagine. Once they are persuaded that a life without masturbation is better than a life with masturbation. Every time we worship God, we're reminding ourselves that He is bigger and better than anything porn can offer. And as we get to step eight, and we begin to see this, and we get it, and it wins our heart, there's going to be some changes in the temptation that we face. And I just want to throw a few warnings out there. One is when we fall from a new height. When we begin to see God is really more satisfying. And yet at some point we fall back into that temptation. The guilt and shame that we feel can be much stronger. But what we must realize is that God's grace is sufficient even from that new height fall. Um, oftentimes maturity leads to independence. We've talked about that. We, once we get to this point, we shouldn't undo anything that we've been doing in terms of living in community and accountability. It's not as if we get to the point that we are far enough in our battle with sin that we don't need one another and we don't need God anymore. There is the pressure of new relationships and new opportunities. As I get into new relationships that are more meaningful and connected, people are going to come to me and rely on me, disclose in me. I'm going to have a chance to share their burdens in ways that I didn't before. And that can become a point of insecurity and pressure. And if I blind myself and just view it as insecurity and pressure, there is a strong likelihood that that's when I'll fall back into my sin. But if, on the other hand, I see that as an incredible mark of God's grace in my life, that people trust me, they're coming, into, they're coming to me, just because somebody brings me the question doesn't mean I have to have the answer. The answers are not in me, they're in Christ. But this is a mark of God's grace that somebody would bring that to me. Let me not view my interpretation as self-centeredly as I did when I was sinning sexually. Let me view this in light of what this says about what God is doing in and around me. It, um, and so we go uh, to Josh Harris. He says, in other words, to rightly embrace our sexuality, we must bring it under the dominion of the one who created it. When we do so, we're not fighting against our sexuality. We're fighting for it. We're rescuing our sexuality from being ruined by lust. Hopefully you can hear that in a way that you couldn't at the beginning of this journey. Uh, to help you capture that, I want to give you six lies. Again, this is in your material. Don't feel like you've got to jot it all down. But that often, that often come as a distraction at this point. I'm getting a second-rate sexual experience. Um, 
Again, what sin always tries to do is make slavery look like freedom. If you look at any sex study, secular or Christian, and just look at the data and says, who has the most satisfying sex life? It's Christians who are married in a monogamous relationship. And the secular, the secular research agrees with that. That's not a pastor standing up here trying to leverage something, drawing a stat out of the air. Another common liar distraction. Now I can get back to focusing on what's important to me. Again, that takes us back to where sin began. I deserve a break. I've been good for a long time now. Again, hopefully you hear that. In light of the other things, it, it makes sense. We're usually tempted to say stuff like that, but when you hear it, let it be a red flag. This is not working because temptation is still present. No one else has to work this hard. Temptation is only easy when you stop fighting it. You know, one of the pictures that Scripture gives for life is it says we live in a fallen world. What that means is that the current of our life is moving towards sin. And any time we are moving against current, it feels hard no matter where we are upstream. The only time it doesn't feel like the current is strong is when we're riding the current. And so if we expect that Again, the temptation will change. Hopefully it will. But at every point, even Paul at the end of his life, a man who wrote Scripture would say, here's a saying worthy of full acceptance. I am the chief of sinners. Because as he fought upstream, everywhere he went, the, the struggles of sin didn't go away. Another one. This is not worth it because blank is still not trusting me. I will say this a bit strongly, but hear it in love. You did not commit to change in order to be trusted. You committed to change in order to be free from sin and honor God. And when you give up on change because you're not being trusted by somebody that you wanted to be trusted by, it proves that that person is more important to you than God. You change for His sake and His glory and His character. And we pray and we hope and it is normally the case that one of the fruits of that that we want and we treasure is the trust of another person, but that can never replace our primary reason for change. And then we get to the point where we just say, blank situation is more important to me. And you know, I, I need to go back to my old work habits where I'm allowing myself to be alone with a member of the opposite sex because it's just practical. That's how we do business. And we use practical as a reason to fall back into the kinds of scenarios that created sin. Um, Pallison. He says, you can't just say no to an evil imagination. You have to appeal to a more profound way to your imagination by working to replace evil, dark, and wickedness in your mind with good, light, and purity. God wants you to have a vision of something so much better than living within your dark, self-centered imagination. God wants to give you a vision of life that as it is meant to be, filled with real, true, intimate relationships with Him and authentic, loving relationships with other people. Um, yet here I would say that kind of vision, those spiritual eyes, they live on communal life support. We don't see that way alone. We need one another. And so if you're at step eight going through these materials, one of the things we advise you on how to prepare for that transition. Make sure you're in a small group. Learn accountability on a broader scale. One of the things that kills accountability is when we view accountability exclusively as a sin hunt. Accountability is looking to fester ways that find out ways that we can pursue God more, not just finding out areas where we fail. And when we have a narrow view of accountability, which it may be for a period of time that we need, but it will not last for a long time, when we have that narrow view of accountability, we don't think it's working unless we're getting beat up. Have a plan for future study. Appendix D in this seminar gives you uh, many passages that talk about lust and its destructiveness and purity and its alternative. Uh, Appendix E gives you an annotated bibliography from some of the resources that we recommend. Um, again, not every resource that I've quoted I think does a great job on the whole. The ones that 
that we think do a best job of presenting a scripture-based, gospel-saturated approach, uh, we give those to you in Appendix E and some summary of what you might find from them. And then make a transition plan. Uh, if you're going through this material for you, take some time to think through what needs to be in place before I get out of a freedom group or before I end my counseling relationship. And I like this from Genesis 2.23. Uh, Charlie says, do not neglect the words at last. When God brought Eve before Adam, and the first thing out of his mouth was at last. It was through that period of searching, that period of sinless waiting on God, that Adam learned to appreciate what God ultimately provided. I would say it this way. When we learn by waiting that God is enough, we are able to truly enjoy every blessing He brings into our life. When we refuse to wait and we try to seize the blessing for ourselves, every blessing degenerates into a curse. And it's in the midst of persevering that we come to find that in new and fresh ways.